and welcome to the latest edition of Resistance TV. With the general election less than two years away and the Labour Party riding high in the opinion polls, it seems an appropriate time to ask whether the NHS would be safe in Labour's hands. Labour Shadow Health Secretary Wes Streety says he wants to reform the National Health Service to bring down waiting lists and improve access to primary care. He says a Labour government would use the private health sector to enable people to access treatment more quickly. And he claims a Labour government would recruit more doctors and nurses. But he's also spoken approvingly about the controversial integrated care systems. And he's attacked the British Medical Association, claiming doctors are hostile to Labour's plans. And furthermore, he and Sir Keir Starmer, as well as other senior Labour figures, have claimed that the pay demands of health workers are unaffordable, even though money is no object for a currency issue in government like Britain. I mean, the truth is claims about unaffordability are usually code for a lack of political will. Well, joining me to discuss the prospects for the National Health Service under a potential Labour government is Dr. Bob Gill. Uh, Bob's a practising general uh, practitioner, GP, and uh, produced a seminal documentary, The Great NHS Heist. I mean, Bob, I wonder whether we could maybe start with uh, West Streeting's plan to use the private sector to cut the waiting list. I mean, he claims that the private sector's got spare capacity. I mean, are his plans realistic, do you think? Hi, Chris. Yeah, so what West Streeting is actually doing is rehashing something we saw just over 20 years ago with with, uh, Alan Milburn's Concordat with the private sector. And what actually that did was set a precedent for the first time Uh, since the NHS was formed, they outsourced clinical services. And that opened up the floodgates for more and more uh, outsourcing to the private sector. What it actually did was saw saw a cherry picking or a cream skimming process whereby the simplest, most straightforward procedures were handed over to the private sector, who were paid, they were paid full contract value even if they didn't deliver all the service they promised in the contract. So if they did, let's say, 80% of the cataract surgeries, they were paid 100% for them. And to add insult to injury, they were paid a greater tariff than what the NHS was paid. So you had actually a subsidization of whatever work was transferred to the private sector. Um, Now, what we're treating completely ignores and uh, is willfully blind to the fact that we have a limited pool of healthcare professionals in this country. So the more work you put into the private sector, well, where are the staff coming from? Those staff will be pulled out of the NHS. So it's actually um, totally illogical and irrational what he's proposing. And it will not solve anything. All it will do is create a greater shift of healthcare provision over to the private sector, which is, of course, what he wants to do. Because let us not forget, you know, he mentioned reform, he wants to reform. The NHS has been reformed to death. What we have now is state funding of a system which is privately controlled, privately dominated. (coughs) And the most most recent reform, which uh, has totally passed Labour comment, is the creation of these integrated care systems, which are, in effect, new public-private partnerships controlled by the private sector, which will have a fixed budget from which they can extract a profit through the denial of care. So, you know, West Streeting is living in some fantasy land. I think uh, the Labour Party in general is pretty confident no matter what it says or does, they will win the next election. But take it from me, their policy direction for the NHS is the same. They What they need to be saying, and if we've learned anything from the pandemic and the outsourcing catastrophe of the uh, pandemic response without with the outsourcing to Serco and Deloitte, wasting $37 billion, uh, in a response that failed to prevent lockdowns. Now, you had a catastrophic outsourcing. That should have been a point at which these neoliberals reflect on the sense of their policies, which are in fact leading to preventable harm and death on a mass mass scale. But they're not. They're ignoring that. They are ideologically wedded to handing our NHS over to US corporations and allowing the NHS turned into a corporate cash cow 
to extract wealth out of the country. That's what they've signed up to. I mean, I guess what Labour might counter with is that, I mean, and it seems that they're kind of going back to the kind of, you know, the uh, the, the new Labour era. And you mentioned Alan, Alan Milburn. I mean, and they, you know, the last Labour government claimed, well, you know, satisfaction in the National Health Service was very high when new Labour left office and that the waiting list had had come down. I mean, do you think that that potential, notwithstanding the criticisms of the privatisation, et cetera, that, that we saw under new Labour uh, creeping into the National Health Service, do you think that um, given what's subsequently happened, that the, the benefits of a reduced waiting list and, and, and satisfaction in the National Health Service could once again be you know, addressed with these proposals or, or as things moved on too much, so, you know, the kind of changes that New Labour did manage to make in terms of, you know, cutting waiting lists um, are not repeatable using the same prospectus. Um, no, I don't think they're repeatable because of the endemic lack of staff within, within the NHS. To get the waiting list down, you need more anaesthetists, you need more surgeons, you need more theatre space. The private sector runs for profit it does not feature in the business model to have spare capacity lying around and staff hanging around being paid for doing no work. That's not how the private sector is run. So he's selling us this fantasy of spare capacity. There is no spare capacity. What he's in fact doing is signaling to the private uh, health lobby that your future profits are guaranteed so why don't you go ahead, go ahead and build up additional capacity because we're guaranteeing to send work in your direction. Mm-hmm. So you see what they're doing? They're, they're front running the growth of the private sector by saying we're guaranteeing you this income. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. the private sector has no incentive to expand. If we had a functioning health service, if we had a health service that hadn't already been brought to the point of collapse by successive market reforms, then there would be no case for going to the private sector because it would be running beautifully efficiently. But what Labour and the Conservatives have done, they've introduced a massive market bureaucracy, which is sucking out, best estimates, around 20% of every pound spent on healthcare. And they saddled the NHS with private finance initiative debt. Mm. Now, if you wanted to take a rational approach, to healthcare, getting the best bang for your buck, you would stop wasting it on the bureaucracy and you would deal with PFI. You would maybe launch a, an inquiry into how some of these contracts are fraudulent and mm-hmm. you wouldn't be paying off the creditors for everything that they were promised in the, in the initial deal. So, you know, borrowing 11 billion and paying back 80 billion and not owning the hospitals at the end of it I suggest to West Streeting that that is a better way of looking for immediate financial, yeah. uh, a stopping of the financial hemorrhage that the MHS, yeah. NHS is suffering. And the staff are paying the price for these PFI debts because mm. their wages have been suppressed to pay for the other liabilities. Well, we'll come on to that in a minute, uh, uh, Bob. But I mean, I wonder whether you might just sort of say something about these uh, integrated uh, care systems. I mean, West Streeting's given them his cautious approval. Um, I mean, perhaps you could say why you think they're problematic and, and what you make of West Streeting, albeit cautiously, but nevertheless sort of welcoming them as, as a way forward. Well, to understand uh, West Streeting's rationale, first you've got to inquire uh, where does he get his funding from? So one of his big funders has interest in private health care. So let's... Uh, Put that That's on West Streeting personally, you know, saying so. yeah, West Streeting for his campaigning finances or whatever has been in receipt of several thousand pounds from somebody with interest in private health care. So we all need to understand that is a foundational fact. He is rubber stamping in in uh, maybe soft words, but he's endorsing the ICS, the integrated care systems. What these are is the final nail in the coffin of the NHS. We had, we've had successive reforms. What the integrated care system is, is another way of describing managed care, which is a medi- uh, an American model, whereby for a 
fixed population of two to three million people. You have this new public-private partnership. Wherever you hear public-private partnership, the alarm bells should be ringing because the public mm -hmm. sector is subsidizing private profit, right? Mm -hmm. So you have these new public-private entities with a fixed budget looking after two to three million people from which any money they don't spend on healthcare delivery, they can extract in profit. Now, immediately that introduces a perverse incentive to deny care to your patients. Now, if any person with any humanity advocates profiteering through the denial of care, well, I, I put it to you that they should not be anywhere near health policy decision making. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Prime Secretary made a speech, didn't he, in the, in the House of Lords, um, which I think in a way is kind of related to what you've, you've just said there in terms of how it's kind of, you know, it, it, you know how, how it's impacting on, on, on people's lives, literally. I mean, I don't know whether you want to say something about that. Yes. Fred. So, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, Lord Premsicca made a very powerful speech where he used the word democide, which is, used to describe how government's policies are having a direct uh, effect on the survival of their own population. And what he, what he brought into all of that was 10 years of austerity, wage suppression, uh, the attack on benefits. And he quoted a figure of over 300,000 people preventably dying as a result of government policy. And he also brought into health healthcare into that discussion, whereby the more we privatize healthcare, the more we copy the American system, where you're going to have a system whereby money is made through the denial of care. You can only guess which direction that will take uh, the chances of the public in terms of getting access to healthcare. Well, there doesn't seem to be much prospect from what I can see that a Labour government's economic policy is going to fundamentally address the inequalities, low pay, insecurity, precarious employment, which is kind of driving those quite horrific statistics that you, you just outlined there that, uh, that Prem Seker was uh, referring to in his, in his speech. Um, so under a Labour government, I mean, you know, that looks like that, unless there is a sort of dramatic change in economic uh, policy, that, you know, that that is going to continue. But I just wonder what you would, um, just moving on a bit, if I can, uh, uh, Bob, about um, what uh, you think about screeching the criticisms of uh, of your colleagues uh, of, of the BMA, British Medical Association. I mean, he's been quite well, be quite robust, I think, in his criticisms. I mean, what do you make of it, and how how the doctors responded to that? Yeah, so I think uh, you know, attacking the staff, not supporting, for example, the nurses' strike action, and then being more direct about the BMA. It, it might win him some friends in certain places, but he's it's a dis, it's a deflection tactic. He's not addressed the main issues that face the NHS, which is retaining and recruiting staff. That is the problem now, and he's not faced that head on. He doesn't seem to understand that if you don't pay people enough and you make them work in horrendous conditions, they're going to leave. He doesn't seem to understand that basic concept of how to retain staff. His proposals are potentially a solution 10 years down the line. How many people are going to die waiting in A&Es in the meantime? Um, I'll give you one statistic. In October alone of this year, there, there were 44,000 people waiting more than 12 hours for a bed after a decision was made that they need to be admitted. So they're sick enough to require a hospital bed. They're waiting for 12 hours or more. Now, we know from studies that for every 80 people in that situation, there's one preventable death. Now, has West Streeting said anything about that? So he's gone on the attack with the BMA. The BMA have, uh, what he hasn't told us, is the BMA has largely colluded with a lot of the privatization reforms. Most recently, the creation of the ICSs. There was a preceding white paper. Uh, published in February of 2021, which the BMA endorsed, right? As did the RCN, as did Unison, and as did the GMB and the Royal Colleges. So you have the leaderships of these representative bodies on the one hand, rubber stamping 
the very bill that will lead to significant erosion and devaluing of their own professions. Now, that is out of step with the membership. It's a bit like the Labour Party. You have a leadership of the Labour Party, which is totally disconnected and couldn't care less about its members. And, you know, Keir Starmer was elected on a series of pledges, which he's broken every single one. So what politicians say in opposition, I'm afraid you you have to uh, take with a very, very big pinch of salt. But in terms of the BMA, I have worries about the BMA because the BMA actually sabotaged their own industrial action in 2016. Um, they are taking contradictory positions. So signing up to the ICS is on one hand and then saying we want to fight for terms and conditions of our doctors. Well, the integrated care systems destroy national bargaining and they create these 42 entities which can decide on local terms and conditions and can decide on where they deploy staff and deploy staff out of their areas of interest or training and also create conditions to worsen patient safety. So the BMA needs to decide, is it genuinely going to fight to defend a doctor's interests and explain it in such a way that the quality of patient care is directly related to having a respected, well remunerated staff that are working in safe conditions. These two are completely linked. But unfortunately, on you know, on past records, unions tend to make it all about pay and do mm. not explain the collateral impact of you know what they're fighting. Why don't mm. they make these very simple arguments that, you know, if you've got an underpaid workforce and you've got a depleted workforce, clearly that's going to have an effect on patient safety. They need mm. to make those points. And, uh, you know, there, I'm, I'm encouraged by a new influx of um, more principal doctors into the junior doctor committee. I just hope that their actions are not diluted or sabotaged, as we saw in 2016. Yeah. The, the criticisms where Streeting has of the BMA are different from mine, and the reasons he criticizes them are just to deflect from mm -hmm. the the herd of elephants in the room that he totally ignored. No, indeed. I mean, one of the points that Streeting uh, was making, and and you're in general practice yourself, Bob. Uh, he was. Uh, I think there's been a proposal to um, reduce the core hours. Uh, could you kind of perhaps unpack that? I mean, what's that about? And you know, are those criticisms valid? I mean, you know, what, what, what's another way of addressing it, perhaps? Yeah, so, you know, the reason we're in a such a chaotic state is because, unfortunately, again, our representative bodies uh, aren't really doing a very good job, and they keep shooting us in the foot. Mm -hmm. I'll, give you, I'll give you some examples. So in 2004, we had a new GP contract, which allowed the privatisation of out-of-hours care and laid the foundations for a two-tier general practice system whereby you have partners who are running the show and a second-class tier of salaried GPs, right? So that actually destroyed the principle of general practice as it was formed. Um, it also created opportunities for entrepreneurial GPs to outsource the provision because the 1948 contract said you have to provide a minimum of I think it was 22 hours face-to-face -face GP care in order for you to maximize your income now that they were there were took place in 2004 under labor a decoupling of having to deliver care yourself and earning an income now you mm -hmm. can guess that has developed significantly you know recently we had um the controversy about American insurance company Centene being the biggest provider of general practice care. Now, rightly, they came in for criticism for providing substandard care and not providing enough doctors to cover uh, their 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 um, outfit. But how did they get hold of all of these practices? Because these entrepreneurial GPs had gathered together practices and then sold out and cashed up. So. Yeah. There is by no means, um, we have vacated the high moral ground some time ago because our leaderships take decisions, don't explain the impact, 
and very often cash up on these decisions themselves. So now 20 years down the road, we have a, you know, a depleted workforce. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I'll give you another example of shooting us in ourselves in the foot. NHS England issued a diktat to stand down general practice. Now, on what planet does it make sense to not use your workforce in a pandemic? Mm -hmm. Right? Why did the GPs accept this without critically thinking about the impacts? And then a few months down the line, you have all the right-wing press talking about the lack of access for general practice. Mm -hmm. Now, could this have been a setup for an attack? I think quite likely. Um, it doesn't make any sense to uh, step down, you know, stand down general practice as they did. So there's a lot going on. This call for restricting the hours of general practice. Well, there were other ways to go to try and manage the workload. I'll give you one example to say that the we will impose or demand a limit on the number of patients per whole time equivalent doctor. We do not think it's safe to have more than, let's say, 1,800 patients per one full-time doctor. Now, that might have managed our workload. And we say we're not going to, we don't want a reduction in income and we want to reduce our head head count per GP. Would that have required a, an increase in the number of GPs, presumably, instead of... Uh, of course. That, of course. Yes, yes. That becomes a government problem then, doesn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Right? Yes. But what did, what did our GP representatives do? They made they gave provided the fodder for the headlines to say GPs are lazy and they're trying to restrict access. Well, it's certainly fallen into the lap of of, of uh, where streeting to kind of join in those attacks. It, it seems to me. I just wanted just to kind of historically, because uh, obviously, you know, you mentioned the two thousand four, you know, uncoupling um, of the GPs' uh, role um, done by Labour. I mean, did did it? In terms of notwithstanding what I said about you know reducing waiting lists for you know acute care etc. Uh, you know hospital care. I mean, do you, do you think that that like new Labour government did did more damage to primary care than than, than Thatcher, or or the or the equally bad in your opinion? Well, it's a tag team, right? So you have yeah. you have the Tories maybe taking a harder line, and then at certain stages of the privatisation, you need a bit of money being pumped in, and that's where yeah, Labour yeah. came in. So Labour yeah. pumped in the money, but they left the NHS with a financial millstone of private finance initiative. They pumped in the money to inflate the management bureaucracy. They pumped in the money to get waiting lists down. Fine. But what that does, you know, it also, it distracts from what they're really up to behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. Which is yeah. the organisational change. So no doubt access to care did improve under Labour. but And the average... Um, uh, sort of pay increase in budget for the NHS in the new Labour years was about 6%, when historically it's 4%. And since 2010, it's been about 1%. So there was mm -hmm. a definite boost in funding going into the NHS. And then you saw improvements in outcome. But behind the scenes, you had this major restructuring going on. And because every everything was getting better, People weren't looking very closely at what Labour were really up to, right? So they got away with actually pushing in the reforms that carried on the Thatcher major agenda. Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So they got. They well, got I mean, it's Blair said there. his job was to build on what Thatcher did rather than to tear it down, if you, if, if you recall. So. And he also said before the 97 election that he didn't believe in marketization and he was going to get rid of the internal market. Well, that, that didn't happen. It didn't happen. No, no, no. Tragedy, really. I mean, uh, considering, I mean, and not insignificant either that uh, a number of health secretaries under Labour went on to uh, work in the private health uh, sector, did they not? Yeah. So Patricia Hewitt, she works, she has uh, various directorships in private health care. I believe she's a chair of the Norwich ICS. Um, mm -hmm. Alan Milburn went on to work for Bridgepoint, I think it's Bridgepoint Capital, um, mm -hmm. who invest in healthcare. He was recently on a podcast, I think it's called the, called the News Agents, which are BBC, ex-BBC journalists, if you can call them that, where yeah. he was doubling down on his disastrous reforms, saying, oh, the NHS needs more reform. Yeah, I think I saw that, actually. Well, yeah, so, yeah. you know, 
when they say reform, this is code for more privatization. They, yeah, yeah. That is the only direction they've been going in, I'm afraid. And the, and the tragedy that, you know, Labour were were absolutely, you know, culpable for all that. But um, I mean, but just moving on, uh, 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 Bob, I mean, Labour says that the, you know, the pay claims that health workers are making are unaffordable, as I was saying in my opening remarks. I mean, what, what do you think the consequences, or you've sort of touched on this already a little bit, I'm just wondering if you can maybe say a little bit more about what do you think the consequences will be if if salaries uh, continue to be suppressed at the National Health Service? And, and perhaps you could say a word or two about the planned strikes by nurses and ambulance workers later this month. Yeah, so, you know, what, what has happened over the last decade is a real terms pay cut of uh, between 20 and 30% for healthcare workers. So that's that's what the pay demands are trying to recover. Because you know, it's not it's not just for improving the financial situation of the workforce that is there, but it's trying to prevent more and more people exiting the NHS, giving up healthcare altogether, working in the private sector maybe, uh, leaving the country Right. So they know people are leaving in their droves. You've also got this problem of the pension tax, which affects senior consultants who end up, if they work over a certain number of hours, they end up paying more in tax on their pension than they have in income. So a total disincentive for these experienced people to provide more provide more hours of, of work. Right. So. So that is a situation. If you increase spending in healthcare, now most of healthcare spending goes on employing staff. There's something called the economic multiplier effect. So for every pound you spend on healthcare, you deliver four or five pounds to the economy. If you increase nurses' wages, not, the vast majority of that will recirculate within the economy more or less straight away. So you actually give it an economic boost. This is quantitative easing for. The population, right? Yeah. But if you don't do that, if you reroute more and more uh, activity to the private sector, where does that money go? That money goes offshore into tax havens. So that has a negative effect on the economy, whereby spending on healthcare, not only does the money recirculate within the economy, uh, you get most of that back through taxation anyway, and you're returning patients who are of working age back into the economy. There was a there was an article in the Financial Times about a month ago, which looked at the increase in people of working age who were no longer economically active, and that correlated with the growth in the waiting list to get treatment on the NHS. So having a totally dysfunctional NHS as we have now has direct effects on the economy. Mm. So for th this sort of simplistic interpretation, we can't afford it, is total nonsense. Why are we at the drop of the hat able to bail out the banks to the tunes of hundreds of billions of pounds? Why were we able to uh, subsidize and bail out the private hospitals, actually, during the pandemic? They received a two billion pound bung just to survive and delivered very, very little for that money. Um, we're sending money to Ukraine, no questions asked. And most most recently, uh, they're going to remove the cap on bankers' bonuses. And I think the value of that might be something I heard figure I saw was about 80 billion. So what they're saying is we can't afford it for working class people or people yeah, who exactly. work for a living, but we can afford it for the rich. Mm -hmm. so we, I mean, that's why I guess it's important that, you know, that workers uh, do – do stand up. I mean, and just in terms of the consequences, I suppose, for the National Health Service, as well as those economic impacts that you mentioned, you've already made this point as well about, you know, people leaving the service. That's just going to create even more pressure on those that's left behind, uh, isn't it? I mean, I think, I mean, how many vacancies are there running within the NHS at the moment? Yes, between 100 and 130,000 vacancies, 40,000 nurses, 10,000 doctors. It's probably gone up, but they're the figures mm. that I can recall offhand. Um, yeah, so we have an en a cross-party engineered collapse, which is being totally covered up and, you know, people being redirected to blame the patients and to blame the staff, right? Mm. And it's being presented as some sort of natural disaster. 
But as I've, I've pointed out to you, we've had a deliberate shrinkage of capacity. We've had financial destabilization through the market and through PFI. And now we're having demonizing and scapegoating of the staff presenting it as they're deliberately choosing to put patients at risk. But that is a total perverse reframing of the reality. The reality is our governments have betrayed those workers that we were clapping just a few months ago. They've totally betrayed them. And to me, actually, it's quite helpful what West Streeting is saying, because that removes these rose-tinted glasses that somehow Labour is going to be better than the Tories. I think that's quite useful for, for what I'm trying to do. Mm. I mean, I wonder if you could maybe comment on the press release that the Labour Party issued in September, where they talked about doubling the number of uh, medical school places, I think, to about 15,000 a year. They said they were going to double the number of district nurses qualifying each year. They're going to train 5,000 new health visitors and create something like 10,000 more nursing and midwifery. Clinical placements. I mean, what do you think of that? I mean, is it adequate? I mean, given the demands face of the National Health Service, or, or 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 not? It all sounds great, but we've heard these promises from Jeremy Hunt. He was going to increase the number of GPs by five thousand. In fact, we've got less GPs per head of population than when he made those promises. Um, as you know, higher education is privatized, so the more people you can churn through the universities and get them saddled with. 30 to 100,000 pounds of debt, that's great business for the university sector. When they come out of those universities and they find out how horrendous their working conditions are, we'll be in the same boat, we'll be having the same discussion. So what, what he's actually promoting is the indebted, indebting a larger proportion of the you know young population, trapping them into entering onto a conveyor belt of disappointment and misery. I would not advocate anybody try and do medicine in this country. In fact, there's a phrase amongst the junior doctors. It's called CCT and flee. CCT is their qualification and flee. That's how mm, they think. Yeah. That. that is the mindset. And there are, we're, there are some figures that are saying uh, from, from the mid 2000s, um, the proportion of doctors who finished training who were still in the NHS uh, within a year or two of qualifying was about 80, 90 percent. And that had fallen to 40 percent wow. over a period of five or six years. So we are, to some degree, subsidizing the education less than when I went through medical school. I, I had no debt. I got a student grant. I came out without owing a penny to anybody. No, of course. But now we have people burdened doctors, hundred thousand pounds worth of debt, and a newly qualified doctor. Do you know how what their hourly rate is, Chris? No, no, I don't. Fourteen pound. Oh, yeah. So they've they've excelled at school. They've got the best A level grades, or uh, yeah, A level grades. They spent five years in university. <laughs> they've got hundred thousand pounds worth of debt. Can't afford yeah. to buy a house. No. And they're paid fourteen pound an hour. And they're working in conditions you wouldn't want to put your worst enemy in. Literally, mm. it's like a war zone. I told you the figures about people waiting more than 12 hours. If you are witnessing that level of neglect and system failure, it damages you, right? Mm. Because you have to you have to live with the guilt of maybe being involved in the care of somebody who's preventably died or has been who's yeah. been neglected in the hospitals. And you know. Either you're broken by it, or even worse, you become conditioned and hardened to accepting it. No, indeed. And I suppose an obvious fact is that, uh, you know, the, the, the private sector that uh, West Streeting and Labour seem so keen to, to uh, you know, bring in, as it were, and utilise, um, all of their staff, presumably, or the vast majority anyway, are you know, trained free of charge by the National Health Service. I mean, they're not yeah, contributing so, to it. So, already. yeah, exactly. So, the the public is subsidizing through the training of these staff, uh, the, the private sector. Um, there have been many well-reported private sector failures. You had the breast surgeon, Ian Patterson, who was doing all sorts of things in the private sector because there's not that much oversight or regulation in the private sector. Uh, you had Serco, who was running the out-of-hours contract back down in Cornwall, 
who was providing one nurse for covering a population of two to 300,000 people out of hours. Then they were found to be falsifying the records to justify, uh, try and prove a point. So they not only were under providing, but they were also committing fraud and putting in, uh, you know, massaging the figures, so to speak. You had Signet Health, which is a mental health provider, which has been um, exposed as providing very substandard care and abuse of uh, patients under their care. Vanguard, you might remember, these were, these were a private surgical company providing cataract surgery who had a complication rate of 50%. Mm. Now, when these services fail, guess who picks up the bill? Guess who yeah. deals with the complications? Probably um, first. You know, in the height of the pandemic, uh, the NHS was telling the private sector, can you stop doing your profitable work for a while? Because we can't cope with the fallout of the pandemic, let alone the people you dump on us when things go wrong. Well, in that period, there were 6,600 transfers out of the private sector into the NHS. Mm. So their work actually creates an additional burden for the NHS. Um, These are transfers of patients. Uh, transfer of patients when things yeah. haven't gone right. And if if you're if you're having care in the private sector and it all goes smoothly, fine. You might have a nice room. You might have a TV and an ensuite toilet. When it goes wrong, you'll find that the medical cover in the hospital is negligible. You'll find that maybe the junior staff that they've employed, if they haven't been trained in this country, they've been brought over from an African country like Nigeria, where they are treated very badly. They are working hours into the hundreds of hours per week, and there isn't any senior medical support for them. So you've got the exploitation of overseas doctors working in unsafe environments. So none of this is being tackled. And what West Treating is doing is advocating more of that unsafe exploitative practice, which is crazy. Mm. Do you think, I mean, Bob, you know, when I was a young kid and, and a young man for that matter, I mean, you could just turn up at, the, at my local GP, you didn't have to make an appointment. I mean, you had to wait a bit of time and then, then introduce an appointment system, which was quite convenient, really, for patients, in my experience. And uh, But they still, uh, the GPs that I was aware of anyway, in my locality, uh, still had a, a period at the end of the surgery where people would just turn up, you know, uh, and then doctors, you know, would come out and so on. I, I just wonder, do you think, is it, I mean, has it gone so far now that we can never get back to those sorts of days? Or, or do you think with the right sort of political will, you know, we could have a national health service again that's fit for purpose, where we do have, you know, genuine sort of, you know, family doctors and, uh, and sufficient numbers of them. So they can provide that sort of service where it is a genuine service. I mean, this nonsense where you, you know, some people are saying that, you know, it's almost impossible to get an appointment to see uh, the GP. I mean, can we? I mean, are you optimistic that we could, but you know, but with the right political will, we could we could rediscover that. We could get back to that, or is it gone? No, you have to have the political will. We need to be calling for the NHS to be renationalised. Re um, I have not myself. I I haven't abandoned those principles of the NHS, which is to maximise continuity of care and provide good access to my patients. So I'm a small outfit. We have 5,000 patients. We have the equivalent of two full-time GPs. I see my own patients. We have very good access because I haven't fallen into the trap that most of my colleagues have, which is to go to, you know, a lot of these initiatives were incentivized. There was a carrot dangle to go on, go on adopt, for example, email consults, online consultations, all of this other nonsense. GPs have been conditioned into chasing these small additional pots of cash, right? Now, if you revert to a system which removes conditionality, increases the uh, amount of money you're getting for your list size, um, introduces barriers to people earning NHS, uh, earning out of the NHS without seeing patients, right? Which is seems pretty obvious, yeah. And do all you can to maximise continuity of care, because not not only is it a good thing the patients like it, you get more job satisfaction as a doctor. You're more likely to be a better doctor because you're learning through the experience of your patients. But we know that it increases 
uh, outcomes. It improves outcomes. There's less mortality. There's less preventable death if you have continuity of care with your healthcare professional. So it makes a lot of sense. But there are other things we can be doing. So a lot of what we're seeing are the health consequences of neoliberalism, right? So if you if you keep uh, the workforce precarious, if you add more and more stress onto the population, stress is a big driver of chronic disease, right? Mm. So you have all the diseases of despair, alcoholism, drug use, depression. Well, why don't we stop causing those things in the first place? It's not so much spending money on dealing with it when it's too late. We need to stop these things developing. And part of that comes by respecting people, paying them decent wages, reducing the stress on the family, um, improving people's diets, stop advertising junk food like there's no tomorrow, control advertising. So we've got, you know, you've got people are eating very badly and all the bad things are being encouraged like drink and gambling and all the rest, right? So why don't we stop promoting the creation of all these problems rather than looking how do we spend more money to try and fix them i can think of a of a good slogan perhaps a variation on uh, something that tony blend uh tony ben i beg your pardon tony blair said you know uh we could uh, be uh tough on on the health ill health and tough on the causes of ill health that might be a good way of of going about it and we could actually deal you know, in a preventative way, in the way in which you which you've outlined, I suppose we've got to keep hope alive, haven't we? And you know, push yeah. for that sort of uh, political commitment, really, and that political will. And um, we need people like you. We need more people like you, Bob, to you know be, be, be banging the drum and pushing uh, pushing the case because it's uh, you know it's a sort of unanswerable case, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> why aren't more so called lefty politicians sort of taking it up? It's, it's depressing, isn't it? Yeah, it's uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. I think people have lost the courage of their convictions. Um, unfortunately, we, we, we're in a an environment whereby even if you speak to somebody on the, who's not of the same political persuasion, you're condemned. Yeah. Right. So, you know, if if a right wing person puts forward a problem, you know, says, I don't agree with lockdowns. Well, we shouldn't we shouldn't demonize him for having that view where we can agree. We need to agree rather than fall into these sort of camps, which, you know, are very become very rigid. Uh, the left has been very bad on pushing back in terms of what's happening to the healthcare. I think a lot of that is down to the unions being nobbled, unfortunately. In in 2006, I believe it was, Patricia Hewitt cooked up a deal with the health unions called the um, Social Partnership Forum, which more or less said, behind closed doors, we will not, we will not, impact or obstruct your health reforms mm. and that deal is still in place so mm. you know the health unions are a big part of the problem the leaderships anyway the membership haven't got a clue what the leadership have signed up to mm. um yeah i'll give you one simple suggestion that why don't we uh, have free school meals for every child yeah. and make that decent quality food yeah Mm. Rather than what we have at the moment, which is a a sort of a very patchy provision, if we can't even feed our children decent food, what sort of longer term health prospects are, are, are they going to have? We have a absolutely yeah. we have an explosion in childhood obesity, and then follows on from that um, childhood, you know, diabetes at a younger age. This is crazy. We're going in the wrong direction. Um, very much so. I mean, and I guess as well. Oh, God, yeah, carry on, Bob. Sorry. Yeah, just, just one example. So did you know that if um, people who are already diabetic, type 2 diabetes, if they lose 10% of their weight or 10 kg, 40% of them can reverse their diabetes? Mm, mm, amazing. Why, yeah. why isn't this being grasped? Because we have a problem of the pharmaceutical industry Controlling education, controlling, uh, you know, GP training, uh, controlling what the regulators do and how, uh, you know, our protocols are formed. So we have the influence of Big Pharma, which is uh, has a financial interest in this dysfunction carrying on. If ever there was a case for nationalisation, I'd have thought that the pharmaceutical industry ought to be very near, if not at the top of that uh, list but just in terms of those consequences on public health that you've outlined i mean in addition to that 
is the is the woeful response of I mean both Labour and the obviously the government you know, Tories are in power, but I mean Labour's alternative is pretty you know inadequate to say the least in relation to uh, fuel prices, uh, energy bills. I mean, and the public health consequences of, of, of that are going to be very dramatic. I mean, we're experiencing very cold weather at the moment, and we know, don't we, that every winter there are excess winter deaths. And I think it was a World Health Organization uh, concluded that, I think it was something over 30%, I may be wrong on that, but 30% of those excess winter deaths are the consequence of people suffering from illnesses caused by living in cold houses. Now. I can only see that getting worse. And you kind of then compare the response of the government in this country and the Labour opposition's alternative, which ain't that much better, to what's happening in France. It's not exactly a kind of, you know, a socialist utopian, but they've capped energy bills, I think, increases, I think it's at 4%. That, to me, you know, demonstrates where there's political will, you know, you can actually do something about it. But I guess, you know, you probably come across uh, people in your work and your surgery and and calls or whatever that, that, that are experiencing problems of, of, of cold homes, uh, Bob, I guess. And uh, Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's not just patients. It's, it's uh, colleagues and staff who say, look, uh, I'm really worried about the fuel bill that I'm going to get in mm-hmm. the, the months. This, you know, So it's a worry for everyone. It's also increased the cost on the NHS. So, you know, hospitals have to st- pay, pay energy bills as well. But mm-hmm. what the government has chosen to do is maintain a corporate racket. They've decided to subsidize the extortionate profits of energy companies. Um, you know, I listened to something the other day which explained how the energy market works. Now, if you run a wind farm, your costs haven't gone up yet. Mm-hmm. You can you can sell your electricity at the same price as gas is set. Now that makes no sense, yeah. Why have energy bills gone up? Because we imposed self-harming sanctions on Russia. Mm. Russia were quite happy to sell their energy to us. Um, You know, if you go into the roots of the Ukraine war, well, you know, how did that all come about, you know? So we have governments who are quite willing to take economically and societally devastating policy decisions because they're not serving our interests. That's all it boils down no, they, to. They're either, uh, serving, they're, uh, they're either serving some sort of American national interest or geopolitical interest or corporate interest. The no, public they, don't get a look in. The no. only thing they do spend energy on is twisting any policy, policy decision in words that might come across as helping the population. Mm. That's all they do. And they're, and they're, they're aided and abetted in those endeavours by the corporate media who just kind of, you know, repeat those sort of the talking points and don't actually give people real news and, and uh, you know, the opportunity to kind of, you know, scrutinise and interrogate what a potential alternative might be. You know, it's just sort of, oh, well, this is how it's got to be, you know, and uh, uh, and as for the war, and you know, and it's all Putin's fault, you know, there's no kind of context, how do we got there and so on and so forth. But listen, Bob, just as a final question, we've sort of... Uh, Trade far and wide, I think, our discussion this evening. I just want to just kind of come back to the point about about Labour. I mean, and having seen what Labour's uh, proposing and and its response to health staff, I mean, do you think that a Labour government would differ that much from the Tories? Or, I mean, would it be better? Would it be the same? Would it be worse, in your opinion, from what you know and what you've seen? It may it may be worse because the population will be lulled into a false sense of security that this government will look after their interests. So there might be a disarming and a standing down of potential resistance if Labour get in. The policy outcome I do not see being meaningfully different. Um, they are, in terms of the NHS, they are quite happy for the Americanization of the, the the NHS, which has happened in legislation, all that all that we're waiting for is the drift in activity and control over to the private sector. But the legal changes are there, and, and unless I hear and see a commitment to renationalisation, I'm afraid we're going to we're going to uh, bed in and double down this two tier system of emergency services in this country being skid row 
it will be luck of the draw whether you survive an acute event like a heart attack or a stroke. You will have a failing ambulance service, the expensive parts of healthcare, which don't generate a profit, will be cut back. For example, intensive care units, there's no money in that high risk. Private sector isn't interested. And they will erect more and more barriers to accessing care. So you will not be able to turn up to an A&E department severely ill. You'll have to ring 111 and get permission before you go to an A&E. And if you go to an A&E out of your integrated care system, they can refuse to see you. So you will have more of middle class drift into buying top up health insurance. And that's what all the media is interested in, is trying to destroy the idea of the the beverage, Bevan model of the NHS is somehow, uh, you know, economically and it's, it's just doesn't work in the modern society, which is total rubbish. Uh, they, they want to keep perpetuating the bad headlines, which are undoubtedly happening, but they do not go to the root cause. So they want us to lose faith in the NHS as a model and accept that the only way forward is to look after number one and take out top up insurance. Yeah. Well, I think the uh, the antidote to, to, to this malaise is uh, raising political consciousness and uh, grassroots action and, uh, and pushing politicians, and, you know, maybe, you know, building an alternative political vehicle, um, resistors, join forces with the Socialist Labour Party. And, uh, you know, maybe that will be the route to offer, a, you know, a proper political choice, a proper democratic choice in in subsequent uh, elections, but it, but it's crucially important, I think, that we that we do everything we can. Those of us uh, that are in the know, those of us that care, to to raise political consciousness. And, and Bob, you're a fantastic champion. And if anybody's not watched Bob's uh, documentary, The Great NHS Heist, it's really crucially important that you that you watch that to get yourself informed, to actually spread the word, spread the the message about what, what's actually being being done uh, in our name. Let's uh, remember, this is supposed to be a democracy. We're going to have to uh, leave it there. I, I just want to thank you, Bob, for taking the time to speak to us uh, on Resistance TV. Uh, thank our viewers for watching. Uh, we should be back at our normal slot on Wednesday of next week. Until then, thanks for watching and good night.